I'm really excited to introduce our speaker tonight, Marty Kagan. Marty Kagan is the author of three leading product management books. Um, you're probably familiar with Inspired. The one on the left is the first edition. Uh, the one in the middle is a second edition. And usually when you write a new edition, it's only you know a certain percentage of the book that gets rewritten. But Marty basically rewrote the whole book. So it's as if it's a second book. And then I'm excited that today his new book, Empowered, is coming out and we get to celebrate the launch with him here today. And this is actually Marty's fifth time speaking at Lean Product. He's the person who spoke here the most. We've had a wonderful tradition of having Marty here every year. And so really excited about that. In fact, I wanna welcome Marty to the Five Timers Club. Marty, welcome. Um, for those of you familiar with SNL, you might know what that joke's all about. So uh, I wanna give Marty a proper introduction. He is the founder of Silicon Valley Product Group, um, before that, he was senior VP of product and design at eBay. He was a vice president at Netscape as well. And before that, was a developer at Hewlett Packard. He's the author of the books that I mentioned, including Empowered, which came out today. Uh, you can learn more about him at svpg.com and his Twitter handle is at Kagan. So he's going to be sharing his advice on product leadership is hard. So uh, without further ado, Marty Kagan, I'm super excited to have you speak. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for a great talk. What I'd love to do now is just do a little fireside chat with me and you. I prepared some questions for Marty for us to talk about. Um, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A. So, yeah, you know, also people that were focused on Marty's talk. Now you can ask questions. I'll be looking over every once in a while over here. That's because I'm trying to see if there are more questions to add to the list from you. So thanks again, everybody. And thank you, Marty. So uh, what I'd like to start off with is your last book, Inspired, as we know, is loved by so many product people. Um, for people that have read Inspired, what would be your kind of summary of how is Empowered different? I know you covered it in the talk, but just how would you in a nutshell tell people the difference, the main difference between Empowered and Inspired? Well, Inspired is all about how an empowered team works. If your company doesn't allow your teams to work that way, and your company wants to become that, then the leaders need to change how they work. And so Empowered is really meant to answer the question of how do we provide the environment that these teams need in order to do good work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, awesome, yeah, makes sense, cool. And then I'm wondering, you know, you, it's funny, you came in at, you said, how many pages is it? Just over 400, yeah. Oh man, yeah, mine's like 350 or so. So wow, that's awesome, that's comprehensive. So I'm wondering, can you just give people a little insight into what the experience of writing it was like? Uh, well, I mean, many of you, if you follow my blog and newsletter, you've been seeing the book sort of develop over the last uh, two years. Um, I, so I remember trying out the concept, there was a conference in Hamburg, uh, that MTP Engage, I think it was called. And I, I wanted to try out the idea of this book. So I created a talk called Empowered. <laughs> um, and it, it, was, it was really an MVP for the book. And I wanted to see how people responded to that message. Uh, and it got, and honestly, I wasn't sure because who knows? And it was, one, but I, it got a lot of, a lot of people told me that this was really needed for them. They didn't understand how to do this. And so um, that would sort of gave me the motivation. Dan, you know this better than most. It's a huge project to take on and not, you know, unfortunately it takes a, it takes a stunning number of hours. Uh, and the pandemic actually accelerated the book by about three months. Uh, the original schedule, um, just because I had nothing else to do for several months, <laughs> I couldn't travel. I couldn't, you know, I still can't travel. But I, I was uh, even quarantining from my family because I had come off a business trip right when the pandemic started. So I had nothing to do but write. And it's a good way to take your mind off crazy politics and crazy pandemics. So I wrote like a madman. So it did come back, come out a little sooner than it would have, a few months sooner. But I'm a big believer. I mean, I, I mean, it, this is one of those things that only I think people that want to write, maybe this is useful too. But uh, first of all, writing is one of the best things I know for helping get your thoughts in order. And in fact, one of the most important coaching techniques is to encoach your people, especially product managers, to get good at writing up their arguments, writing up their thoughts. 
Uh, I'm a big believer in that. So in just in general, that's a good thing. I also believe that uh, try to break things down into the separate concepts and get feedback on those concepts is a really important idea. And then just like I did with Inspired, I picked a set of people that I knew were like right in the target audience. These were product leaders that had never done it before. Like I didn't pick people that were already a product leader at Netflix. They already knew this. I picked people that didn't know those things, but wanted to. And, uh, and I used them very sincerely. I mean, if you know the inspired techniques, one of my favorite techniques I describe in that book is the customer discovery program. And uh, that's what I did. I just used it, the, the set of people as the drivers. If I felt they needed it in order to do their job exceptionally well, then I put it in the book, even if it was hard. Uh, the, the hardest one where I was on the fence was the team topology section. For a long time, I thought I still need to do that one-on-one, -on -one, but, but I felt like I know they need this. So that took some real effort. Cool. Well, that's good, man. So total time to write it. How long was total calendar time? What'd you say? Like about 18 months to write. And then as yeah. you know, <laughs> about six months to publish. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. That's great. Cool. All right. So a lot of great advice for top product teams there. I'm just wondering, what do you see? If you had to sum up, I'm sure you get this question a lot. What do you see the top product teams doing that other product teams aren't doing? Like what, what are the key things that differentiate those top teams? Okay, but now we're talking product teams, not product leaders. Yeah, yeah. teams, yeah, teams, I think, yeah. Yeah, well, um, three things, <laughs> three things. Uh, and I believe I may have talked about this in one of the first talks I gave to your group. Right. Um, but uh, the first thing is that they tackle risks up front. So they know they're worried about value, usability, feasibility, viability. They don't always have the same four taxonomy risk that I use, but doesn't matter. They think about it. They're like, this is a risk. We have to do it. Um, second thing they do really well is how they actually solve the problems that they're given. They, uh, in the bad teams, you know, a product manager writes up some form of requirements ranging from a PRD to user stories, and then throws it over to a designer who's told to do wireframes and comps. And then they deliver that at sprint planning and the engineers are told to build. And of course that's waterfall. And that is, that is not where innovation comes from. In fact, that may, way of working is almost guaranteed to prevent innovation. So I'm looking for people to solve problems collaboratively. And then uh, the third one is what do they consider success? Do they consider sex success an outcome or is success shipping a feature output? If those three, those are the three things I consistently see done well, even if it's a company I've never set foot into before, I've never met anybody there. If they're doing those three things, they're good. Uh, just that's what I find. They're good. Uh, and if they're not doing those three things, they rarely are innovating. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I remember you, you had your talk beyond lean and agile that I'm remembering, you know, you were talking about some of these things. Um, and so I would recommend everybody again, it's on our YouTube channel, Marty's other talks There's one he gave on beyond lean and agile that I thought was awesome. Just kind of abstracting out discovery versus delivery and managing those risks up front, which was awesome. So cool. Um, and then on the flip side, I guess, what are the top mistakes you see product teams make that, that hopefully they could avoid? Well, there's another talk I think we might have done together about, you know, common mistakes. I think it's called product is hard. I gave a talk there. Yes, uh, and that's right. I'm always tweaking my most common mistakes. The truth is I do need to update that because I'm seeing different mistakes during the pandemic. And of course, the reason okay. is, is because we're working from home, right? Right. And working from home, it, it, let me just put it this way. You know, working from home, the delivery issue is not the problem. It's discovery is the problem. And there are more fundamental issues going on for discovery when everybody's working from home than, uh, than the ones I normally talk about. Because uh, it's not that the ones I normally talk about aren't also problems. It's just that the team doesn't even get there. The reason they don't get there, well, first of all, trust is eroding. 
um, you know, we're losing because we don't go to lunch together every day because we don't get to know each other the same way. People are sloppy over Slack, terrible over email. And, you know, trust gradually erodes and everything collapses when that happens as far as collaboration. Also, it's a lot harder for us to sort of sit around a prototype, discuss and debate and come up with a better solution. There are good communication tools, argue, I think better than ever, clearly better than ever, but that's not the same as a collaboration tool. And I am very grateful for the figmas and the envisions of the world, because if, if we didn't have those cloud-based you know, prototyping tools, we'd be hosed. Um, but uh, even with those, we fall into behaviors that run counter to the collaboration we need. So yeah, what I've been doing a lot is coaching the leaders that they need to coach their people much more aggressively through this because uh, these are really bad behaviors. Yeah, in fact, one of the questions I, I know you and I are both big fans of co-located teams. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, that's not possible. So there are a couple of questions about what's your take when you have this constraint? What are your thoughts on, you know, how to make the most of it? And are we, are, is it okay to relax co-located teams or what do we do basically, Marty? Help us out, Marty. What do we do with the pandemic? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and it's worse than that really, because um, remember in a lot of the world right now, it's not just a pandemic, it's also lockdown. And in that case, you know, if you've got like, Dan, you've got two little kids, if you have to do childcare, if you have to do homeschooling, I mean, how much work could you really get done during the day? And, and I, don't, yeah. I don't care what the scenario is, that's not, you know, and if you didn't have those concerns, you'd probably be quite productive, at least for many things. But so that's kind of throwing a wrench for a lot of people. And I try to tell managers to cut their people some slack. That's, there's just no good answer to that. Um, there's just no uh, other, other than getting kids back in school and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, like somebody saying they're in quarantine with their three-year-old, yeah, trying to do anything is hard. I know, <laughs> I know. Um, thankfully, yeah. my kids are I, old If I enough. could jump in, jump in on that, like I, when the pandemic first started, what happened is all the people that didn't have kids, their productivity went up because they didn't have anything else to do but work. Yep. And so several tech, my, my neighbors that do have kids here in Menlo Park, like the CEOs had to have a talk on all hands and be like, okay, for those of you who don't have kids, Okay, <laughs> like yeah. you need to give it's the really that true. Have kids a break. Yeah, it's really yeah. true. And so, um, yeah. but even if you pull that aside, even if you pull that aside and say, "All right, let's not look at those situations." Let's say everybody's got just as much time as they they want, uh, and they're able to get that work. With they're still really struggling in terms of the discovery work. Um, yeah, uh, in fact, one person, Vincent there, just cited an article I was just about to cite. One of the user researchers that I like a lot at Atlassian shared that, you know, this is really our discovery is much harder to do when we're remote. Um, and that's the reality. So one of the things I think is a consequence of the pandemic is that many more companies realize just how important co-location is. Now that said, even before the pandemic, we were we were at a breaking point, especially, you know, Dan and I, the Silicon Valley area, Seattle area, New York area, London, is really expensive to live and very hard to recruit people to. And so that was not sustainable. So we were already moving to the idea of remote offices. And I do think remote offices, uh, the combination of remote offices and remote workers, and I should acknowledge the best part about working from home is the talent pool grows hugely, right? People all over the world, and I love that. Um, and there are some uh, tasks like user research that can actually be done at least as well uh, remotely. So, cause we don't have to spend all that time traveling. So there are things for sure. There's good things too, but discovery overall is the thing that's suffering. Yeah, that's a whole other talk. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The delivery, delivery would suffer less because we're used to the ceremonies. We're used to JIRA. We're used to getting together on Zoom and you can do stand-ups and that makes sense. But the discovery, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, cool. Well, I want to ask a question. Um, since this talk and your book is kind of focused on product leaders, for people that have like maybe recently become product leader, they're a product leader for the first time, what would be some of the top tips or advice that you would give them? Well, uh, not to sound too self-serving, read, but book. read <laughs> the book. You know, I mean, absolutely. I think you should. That's why I wrote it for people like that. Sure. You know, it's written for leaders and aspiring leaders. I mean, right. to me, and I, I have a tendency to get overly optimistic sometimes, but in an ideal world, we're only a few years away from awesome product companies because there are so many very high potential product managers out there right now and engineers and designers. And if we can show them how to become a great leader, it's gonna to totally change companies. So that would be the ultimate answer. Uh, you know, fundamentally, I think reason we're in the situation we are as an industry is that most product leaders have never seen good. They have never had a chance to work at a place that works well. And so it's all theoretical. I mean, they don't know. Nobody coached them. Uh, I, I told you I was coached. In fact, I was at HP 10 years. Every single day there, I had at least one manager there to help me get better at my job. How many people do you know that can say that? You know? Yeah. Intuit was another company yeah. that famously coached I, I, people. Of, I know. And I meant to add, that's where I started my career. I can think of my GM. I won't say his name to keep it private, but, but I, my GM was all about coaching. And I was very fortunate to meet Bill Camp. I didn't know you dedicated the book to him. That's awesome. Um, and I love the emphasis on coaching, but I agree. And I feel like, uh, and maybe it's, it's, it's largely just an excuse but people, one, the top excuse is I'm too busy, right? As a, many PMs are player coaches. They're play, you know, like they're coach, player, manager, manager players where, yeah, I just got promoted, but I still got to run these two scrum teams while I manage these new people. And, and it's kind of like, it reminds me, Marty, of like the coders, like the, the best coders. Hey, your reward is getting promoted to be an engineering manager. And guess what? You don't get the code anymore. Now you got to do something completely different. Why would you be qualified for that? The PMs, a lot of times it's IC work, it's individual work, and then you become a manager. And exactly like you said, if somebody hasn't taught you how to be a good manager, how to be a good coach, why would you be a good coach, you know? Yeah, I think you know Christina Wadke, don't you, Dan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's yeah. she's spoken twice. She's in the two-timer club, not the five-timer club, two-timer club, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've known her a while too, and I really like her. And she, uh, she was one of the leaders, design leaders that I profiled. And oh, she awesome. had, I, uh, one of my favorite quotes in the book is from her. She said, you know, the, 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 the inflection point of her career as a product leader happened when she realized that her job was no longer to design great products, but to design an organization that can create great products. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's a right. pretty fundamental insight. And I heard that, I mean, that's sort of, we all go through that. You know, your product is no longer the product, it's the people. Right. And I've heard some PMs when they become leaders use the same metaphor. My job now is to think of my PMs and my org as a product. And what are the objectives for that product? And, you know, how do I max, what are the metrics and how do I optimize those, those kind of things? So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if, if you have any top, like just since we mentioned Bill Campbell, any top things that like any advice from him that is inspired by him that you would share with product leaders? Well, I, I put lots of quotes of his in the book, of course. And uh, and yeah, I mean, I should have mentioned he was on the board and CEO for a while of Intuit, right? For a long time, mm -hmm. he was yeah. there on their yeah. board uh, and uh, on the board of Apple and Google. Um, and just an amazing, amazing guy. It's funny because I think, Dan, you know the book Trillion Dollar Coach that really yeah, just is it. a collection yeah. of his quotes. Um, mm -hmm. And I had, I was lucky enough I was not lucky enough to be coached by him. I wish I was, but I met him a few times. And, but the reason I met him is because three of the managers I had were coached by him. And anyway, so I, when I read that book, Trillion Dollar Coach, I'm, I read all these quotes that came from him and I'm thinking, 
wait a minute, I thought that was me. <laughs> and it wasn't me. <laughs> it's just I had forgotten that I got it from a manager that got it from him. And I realized so much of what the best companies do came from him. I mean, that's honestly, I felt like, well, this guy, uh, should, I should dedicate the book to him. These principles are really yeah. originated there more than anywhere else. Cool. Yeah, no, I was glad I got to interact with him there as well, too. That's great. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions, and then we'll go to audience Q&A. Inspired first came out over 10 years ago now. I think it was 2008, was it? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So, um, and it's been exciting to see PM. It feels like in the last five-ish years, it's really exploded. So I'm just curious from when Inspire first came out, How? what are your top, your top, kind of thoughts on how PM has changed? Like what are the major changes you've seen in that time for PM? Yeah, well, it's almost, it's easier to talk about how good PMs have changed and how most PMs have changed. Because okay. unfortunately I would say most, the average PM has <laughs> got worse. Uh, mm -hmm. I really do believe that. And I don't, and I think the reason for that, and I, I hate to say this because it's, it's an unintended consequence, but I think the reason was the move to agile. And what happened was when companies moved to agile, they knew they needed this person called a product owner. They didn't have product managers, most of them. They did have people like business analysts and they did have people like project managers. And they're like, you be the product owner. And then of course they became the product owner. They took a CSPO class which is the administrative part of a development yeah. process. And, but they position themselves in a company as product managers. And so in so many CEOs I meet, when I tell them about what a good product manager is, it's like, have you met any of our people? They're like, nothing like this. Uh, it's like, and, and the problem is it's really uh, created a big problem. I try, the way I try to explain it is, if you were to, um, you know, every develop, let's say your company's using Scrum, most of them start with Scrum. Uh, you know, everybody, including the developers, goes to some amount of, they might read a book or go to a class, but they need to learn how the process works. But just because they learn how Scrum works, does that mean they learn anything about coding? Nothing. They don't teach you how to code. They teach you the mechanics of a sprint. The same is true with a CSPO. It teaches you the mechanics of your responsibility as the product owner role. It doesn't teach you how to product manage. And so the average product manager has just got so weak that honestly, there's, uh, you know, I wish it wasn't even called the same thing. It's just, you know, it, it should, there's just such a disconnect there. Um, now, if you want to talk about product at good companies, it's different. Think product at good companies, there, then we look at the principles have been pretty constant. And I is really the, the role they play on a good team, responsible for value, responsible for viability, has not changed. And I don't see it going away. I just see it getting harder because the constraints are harder, the markets are tougher, the competitive landscape is harder. But uh the techniques, on the other hand, changing faster than ever, in a good way. Yeah. You know, when right. when techniques change, it's because some better technique came along. So we constantly see improving techniques, but the principles of what the role is. Um, no, I I don't see a scenario that doesn't have a product manager in the foreseeable future. Even though you can imagine, if in a sort of science fiction sense. Would we one day to be able to describe enough that a tool could generate a good user experience? Maybe, I'm not gonna hold my breath for that, but maybe, could you get to the point where you could describe the necessary product and technology generates the code? Maybe, again, I'm not gonna hold my breath for that either, but can you imagine a scenario where a tool or technology works out all of these constraints between something that's marketable and sellable and, and compliant and uh, monetizable and affordable and all of these things a product manager has to balance predicting the future. That's again, 
maybe one day, but who, you know, we're way out there now. Yeah. So we've got job security from AI. You're saying we're good. I think good. so. It's such a complex job. You know, I don't think the AI would want to do it. You know, it's not, it's a, it's a thankless job, you know, so. I'm joking, um, but I totally hear you. I, I love the uh, distinction between the average PM and like the the great PMs, and it makes me think of like a bell curve distribution and three sigma. And I feel like the bell curve, the, that end is growing, <laughs> but for some reason the mean isn't moving too much, right? Like, well, I, to me, they're different. I, think... I feel like they're two different curves. Okay. In a good okay. company, they have a curve because not all product people are great. But sure. you know, in a good company, there's yeah. one curve, and in most company, there's another curve. And what okay. I think, if you average them all together, then I think the mean is drifting in the wrong direction. Got it. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. And it's 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 funny because the other version I get of it is like people should read your books and my books and Christina's books. And like the best practices are out there. The best practices are out there for people to learn. And yet you constantly come across people who are unaware of them. You know, and I think part of it is maybe tech is growing so much. You get so many new entrants, new PMs, new designers, new engineers coming straight out of school. And they just, they haven't heard of any of this stuff yet. So it's, it's just kind of interesting that, that divide. Uh, I think there's also a lot of people that have read our books, but don't know, don't aren't in a company where they're really allowed to do it. I agree. Now you see a lot of the questions. I'm going to filter some of them because my answer would probably be the same as yours. Is like you need to go to a different company. It's like <laughs> if that's what, if that you know by all means try to change your environment, but if you've tried, then you probably need to go to a different environment because I agree with you. And and I think your other point to pick up on was people haven't seen what good or great is, you know, and that's where um, I was very fortunate to be into it to see what a great product team looks like. And, and when you see it, then it, it's basically the Bezos quote about setting a high bar. That's, that's basically, yeah. you know, the best thing we can do. So yeah, Scott, awesome. Cook, Scott Cook set a very high bar. Yeah, yeah, no, it was awesome. Cool. And then uh, awesome. So let's close out with one last question. Several people have asked, so are there They've heard rumors there are additional books planned from SVPG, Silicon Valley Product Group. Are, are you able to comment on that at all? Yeah, uh, in fact, the publisher, who you know, uh, decided to, uh, was confident enough, he put them both in the, uh, you know, intro front matter of the book. Um, there's one oh, being cool. done by Leah, Leah Hickman. Uh, I, I don't know if you know her yet not or not, Dan, but she would be, she's an awesome speaker. Leah yep. Um, yep. is writing a book on, so, so Inspired was aimed at product teams and Empowered is aimed at product leaders. She's aiming at the C-suite and she's talking really, of, it's called Transform, Transform. Um, it's all about the transformation topic because one of the huge things we've learned is that to really transform, it goes well beyond product design and engineering. And so she's kind of the expert on that at SVPG. And then um, the other one is Martina Luchenko, who I think you know. Martina mm -hmm. um, is uh, our product marketing partner and she is writing a book on product marketing called Loved, uh, which is all about how to do product marketing. Awesome, cool. Well, it sounds like two great read books, cool. Can we set any expectations on time or not yet? Well, I mean, I, I've been reviewing uh, progress on yeah, both of them. You. They are, uh, but they're both targeted for the second half of 2021. Excellent. All right. Another bright light for 2021. Excellent. Good, good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Well, great, great, Marty. It was so good to chat with you on those topics. Always great to hear your wisdom. Let's transition over to audience q and I'm going to pull up the questions that I've been curating while um while well, you've been giving your talk let me pull them up here. and then this is where i will i didn't give a chance to proactively chat to people to give them a heads up I, the first person let's see who the first person is let's see is okay let's see here okay is akshay single akshay there you are cool Akshay, i'm going to ask you to unmute Akshay, feel free to come on and uh, unmute your camera if you want you had a question about feature teams versus empowered teams if you want to ask that, you're welcome to Thank come you, up. And I'll, yeah, you want to do your uh, camera? You have a camera? Yep, I'm here. You know. Hi, everyone. Right. Oh, my bad. Let me get my spotlight out. Hold on. I'll get you in there. 
I can't show up yeah, next to Martin. So yeah, I, there you I are. See. Cool. <laughs> Um, so first of all, Dan, Marty, both there of you, you thanks for the great books. Um, I've read both Inspired. I've been at the Inspired Workshop. I've signed up for the Empowered Workshop. So big fan and really thankful for your work. The question I had was, even though you've been doing all this evangelism about how feature teams and empower teams are different, and I think a lot of us are beginning to understand, or probably not as many as, as you would hope. Um, so feature teams are still quite prevalent. And as we try to transition into empowered product teams, there's a lot of issues, which I think the book that you talked about, Transformed, would probably help. But if you're trying to do this with a product team, as in I have a mandate where I can actually change how the product organization and the engineering organizations work together. But if you've done this for years, people are used to a certain way of working, just delivering features, accountability is low, ownership is low. Do you have any tips or advice on how do you bring a team like that along to change the way they work? Yeah, well, this is the transformation question because it's really not that hard as you've probably seen to change your own teams. The product and engineering, it's not that hard. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you've outsourced your engineers, there's big issues, we have to fix that. But for the most part, it's not that hard. What's hard is getting the rest of the company to understand what it means to really um, be a product what some people call product led or uh, a real product organization that impacts finance. It impacts the stakeholders. It impacts HR. Uh, it impacts sales and marketing in a big way, uh, but it totally changes the dynamics because fundamentally you're moving from the subservient model where you're there to serve the stakeholders to the customer focus model where you are there to serve customers in ways that work for the business. And that, you know, you can sugarcoat it all you want, but fundamentally that's a power change, a control change. And uh, so I, I know where you're coming from, for sure. We've all seen it so many times. This is also why I argue that to really make this happen, it needs the support of the CEO. Um, just selfishly at SVPG, we've learned if the CEO isn't really driving this, we don't spend our time on it because we don't think it's going to work. Um, and so, yeah, uh, by the way, there's an article I wrote called Keys to Successful Transformation, which I wrote with Leah. We wrote, we sat down a few months ago and said, from all the companies we've seen transform successfully, which is a sub, tiny subset, of course, of the ones that try, um, what are the things that they've all done? that made the difference, we think. And, and it starts with the CEO. But I think you, you might like that article because those are the things I think you need to do. You can do a pilot team, but to really get your company to change, it's a bigger deal. Good luck. All right, great, thanks for your question, Akshay. Next up, we have Anthony Martyr. Anthony, if you're uh, here, feel free to, I know you're here actually. Uh, feel free to unmute. If you have video, feel free to do video. Let me get you on here, Anthony. There you go. Okay. All right. And then... All right. Now I'm unmuted. Yay. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Hey, hey, hey Marty. Um, thanks very much for a great talk. Really looking forward to reading the book. Um, inspired has been really inspired for me, and it's been really um, great for the community down here in New Zealand as well. Um, and that's, that's kind of my question. So, you know, Inspired's been around for a few years now. Um, and, you know, you were trying to shift the, the ways of people thinking about product from those feature teams to, you know, empowered teams. What's your kind of feel from sort of when you wrote the first one to where we are now about the proportion of companies that have moved in that direction? Do you think, has it been a, bit, a large amount, a small amount? What's your feeling there? Oh. Good question. By the way, congratulations to your country is like one of the few sane countries on the planet. Wish, wish we could all uh, go there. So, yes. uh, this is an this is an actual office behind me. By the way, I'm actually in the office. So <laughs> you're rubbing it in. I know. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, oh, all right. I I I went almost this entire talk without getting on my high horse about this, but. Um, the thing that's, well, the honest answer I'd have to say is overall, we're getting worse, overall. And I think the biggest reason for that 
is not the good companies and even the feature teams. It's the, um, it's the organizations that are moving to safe. So you guys probably know it's safe is it's got scaled agile framework and it's not quite as evil sibling less. Uh, and these things are, I understand why the CEOs, CIOs in particular want to go back to that. They miss those. Are, it is so command and control. It is the opposite. If you were to put Netflix at one end of the spe spectrum, you would put safe on the other end of the spectrum it is that far apart. And unfortunately, you know, it's a, it's a machine. They market the hell out of that. And it's very deceptive marketing. They have every agile and lean buzzword possible and none of the meat. And unfortunately it's convincing a lot of companies. And so overall, now I have to say, I have not seen it make inroads into the product world. But it, you know, most of the world is not really the product world. It's banks and insurance companies and manufacturing companies, and they have really gravitated towards that. So uh, that I think is really hurting. It's taking us backwards. Um, and I don't know really what to do about that. Um, uh, you know, it would take a massive mark. I mean, in one sense, I'm like, look, you get what you, you deserve what you get. And that's the case where I do what Dan was alluding to. If I meet a product person from one of those companies or an engineer, I'm like, you know, you just need to move to a good company that understands the difference. But normally it's not that bad. Feature teams are not the end of the world. Feature teams are much closer to how a good company works. And it's not that hard to move from feature teams to product teams. So I would be a lot happier if, if all of those companies that were using the safe stuff, which is really delivery teams, were at least feature teams. Thanks, Maddie. I'm working with an organization that, that I'm trying to unsafe. So yeah, fun times. <laughs> well, I wish you the best of luck. All right, Anthony, nice question. Now I thought I could have swore it was a Zoom virtual background, but someone just walked behind you. So now I know you weren't blessed. <laughs> But uh, thanks a lot. Glad to see folks from New Zealand joining our meetup. Yeah, I, I was joking. I know it's real, but awesome. Thanks. Great question. Hey, Marty, super quick. There's a question about, are you familiar with Basecamp's shape up approach before I, should I ask that question or not? Are you familiar with that approach? I am. I wasn't until recently. And then uh, I okay. don't, I know okay. Ryan Singer and I, um, we had some okay. chats and I, so I did read it. Yes. Okay. So I don't know, David, Wygan, that was your question. If you want to unmute and ask it, I'll let you do that. Sorry, I caught you cold. I didn't want to catch Marty cold, so I thought I'd ask him if he was familiar with it before I popped you on there. So, David, feel free if you want to unmute and. Ding, ding, ding. Or did he sign Give off? Give him a second. No, he's there. He's there. I check. I check beforehand. I make sure someone's there. But I'll just ask this question if he's not there. So basically, what do you think about Basecamp shape up approach? Basically, was this question, Marty? Yeah. Uh, so, and what I'm about to tell you is exactly what I told him, uh, the author of Shape Up. So, um, it's uh, it works for Basecamp. Basecamp has a small number of brilliant founders. And even though uh, Ryan's not a founder, I told Ryan's a triple threat, strong in engineering, strong in design, strong in product. So, but philosophically, it's the opposite of empowered teams. I mean, really the opposite of empowered teams. Uh, the shaper, which is really a product manager, what most of us would call a product manager is, it's like you have this shaper that defines everything and hands it down to engineers. Uh, I didn't, that was the sense I got from reading his book, but I didn't really think he would really argue that until we talked uh, and um, he, no, he, they believe that. <laughs> they believe that engineers <laughs> should focus on coding and designers should focus on design. And uh, my argument, of course, is pick any of your favorite innovative products and look at how it was done. And it was the opposite of that. Yeah. Now, yeah. Again, it's harmless for Basecamp because of their size. 
Although I still think, you know, would they have been slack if they had used, tapped into the brain power of their engineers? Maybe, who knows, but not in the way they were working. So no, it's, uh, I would never recommend it for those same reasons. It's not <laughs> evil like safe is, yeah. but unfortunately right. it's got a lot of the same, it's got a lot of the same consequences of safe. Uh, next up, let's see here. There's a lot of great comments about safe in the chat here. Okay, next up, do we have Shantan? Let's see, Shantan, are you here? Let's see, if you are, then yep, you're here, cool. Feel free to, there he goes, he's in, he's jumping in. He doesn't need an invitation, he's hopping right in, good. Let's see. Uh, hey, Marty. Hi there. Hi. It was a great talk. Thank you. I've been following you, I mean, quite recently for the past uh, six to eight months. Sorry for missing you out all these years. <laughs> but yeah, I've been, uh, I mean, watching all of all your old videos. And Dan, thanks uh, thanks for uh, uh, putting me here. It's, it's, it's great. Thank you. My question is uh, about, uh, uh, I've seen, because I've seen, uh, some companies which have product and engineering teams both reporting to the same senior leader. Uh, did you consider that as an empowered model? Because I think it kind of enables decisions, uh, I mean, technical decisions or business decisions make uh, making it more, more seamless. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, yeah, so the question, I think, just to make sure we're on the same page, normally there is a head of product there's a head of design, head of engineering. They report up to the leader. Sometimes, a lot of times, the head of product is product management and design. But they're they're normally, you know, they those three would report to the general manager, the CEO. That's normal. Uh, but once in a while, the there is one person. It might be called CTO or it might be called CPO. And in some companies, it's literally the CPTO. <laughs> You've probably seen that in a few companies. And the truth is that is orthogonal to whether or not the teams are command and control or empowered. Uh, I don't see a correlation there. Um, it's, not a, it's not that common because those are both huge jobs. That's why. Most of the time you have a leader, like a let's just say it's chief technology officer that is responsible for both. Normally, what that means is that under them, they have a VP product and a VP tech engineer. So all it is is an extra layer. And so whether or not they're empowering or whether they're command and control is, is separate. So I, I you know, if, if that leader is, hopefully that leader is somebody who appreciates the importance of both. If they don't appreciate the importance of both, that's where a problem can come. You know, a lot of times when we talk about organizations, it's about picking your battles. Um, and some things really do matter. So for example, when I find a design organization buried under marketing, I'm like, oh, this makes me really nervous. Marketing's got very different goals, very different needs. The chances of that design organization doing product design well is not very high. I'll usually make a bigger deal over that than if they happen to have a common leader for uh, product and engineering. Got it. You know, since you mentioned it though, the bigger issue I see is that the technology organization, the engineers, are run by a CIO rather than a CTO. And while I know exceptions to this, the CIO is a very different model. That is the cost center model. And uh, it can be very hard for CIOs to transform. So that actually concerns me more. Uh, yeah. So do, do you think Netflix is uh, in that kind of zone? Uh, where uh, is that? Is that how the the, the organization is set up? It, what, what, um, no, I would say Netflix is not. I mean, none of the problems. I mean, they very much optimized an organization for empowerment. So, and of course, remember they're huge now. They're huge, and and they're not just doing tech products. They're also creating movies. 
and TV shows, which is a different kind of product, obviously, but it was amazing to me. One of the coolest things over the last 10 years for me is to watch both Netflix and to a lesser extent, Amazon, and to a way lesser extent, Apple, apply the product skills that they've learned to creating content. It is shocking how well it's worked. And uh, I think that's cool. Just like watching Tesla apply their skills to cars or watching Pixar apply their skills to feature films, animated films. I love it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jantan. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jantan. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I think um, it's great to hear these other examples. Um, you just made me think. So recently I heard um, Mark Randolph, the first CEO of Netflix, his book, That Will Never Work, just came out in September. He spoke at the Product Leader Summit, which I co-host, which you spoke at. So I highly recommend that book. It was great to check out. I'm actually trying to get him to speak here. Hopefully he'll come in. And then you just mentioned Pixar. So uh, Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. A lot of product people really love that book. It's funny because Ed, I want to get him to speak here too. He hasn't worked in pure software. He's worked at Pixar. And so he doesn't know our world. But when you read his book, you realize, dude, that's the same thing. Like what you're calling that, like the audience, like they test their movie. It's the same thing we do with user testing. So anyway, cool. All right. Next question up, Sharon Sue Plasser. Sharon, if you want to uh, unmute and do your video. Hey, Marty. Great Hi. talk. And I'm super excited to read your book. Thanks. Um, so as a product leader, do you have any advice on how to create a vision that balances where you want the product organization to be headed over the next five years against what actually needs to be done to support the current business? For example, what the org should have been doing over the last five years? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, these are two different goals we have. The vision is where are you trying to go in five years? That's really its purpose. But of course, I've never been at a company where that's all we had to do. We have to sustain the company as we get there, right? And that's where product strategy plays because product strategy is meant to take us in the direction of the vision, but we have to deliver for the business every quarter. So it's really the, the answer to your question is really the combination of the product vision and the product strategy. And I was saying, you know, the product leaders, they kind of live and breathe the product strategy for a lot of their, you know, day, every day. And that's really why. Thanks. Sure. Okay, next question up we have Sylvia Dondukova, I'm butchering your name, sorry. Sylvia Donduka, Donduakova. Don so, that's good, Dan. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Yeah, 70, I'm gonna iterate my way there. I'm agile, I'm gonna iterate, iterate my way there. Hop in here, let's <laughs> get you spotlighted. There you go, ask more of your question, please. Um, yeah, hi, Marty. My hi. question is around product strategy. And um, if a product leader wants to get some external help or hire a company to help with that, how would a successful engagement look like? Obviously, nobody else should come up with your product strategy. And I see a lot of companies kind of expect that, but what's your take on creating that in a successful way? Yeah, no, that's a really good question because there's no secret that the management consultancies are, this is where they make their money and, and this is their main services to help you with strategy. Now, here's where I need to uh, be a little uh, nuanced. There's many, many forms of strategy. Monetization strategy, go to market strategy, um, launch strategy, release strategy product strategy, business strategy, sales strategy. These are all legitimate strategies. Most of the time, there are many companies you could hire to help you with product strategy. But what you need to understand is most of them are not experienced in product strategy. They're experienced in business strategy. And so it's a, the truth is I have very mixed feelings about it. I actually put a sidebar in the new book about this exact question because it comes up a lot. Uh, and here's, the, here's where I have mixed feelings. 
the people that you would hire at those agencies, whether it's a McKinsey or somebody like that, they're generally really good people. And just getting their help can be very valuable. Unfortunately, it usually takes many months before they have enough context to actually contribute to a product strategy, even if they know what product strategy is, and most of them don't. So what I kind of said in the sidebar was, you're gonna have to do this, but if you get an opportunity to hire one of them, do it. Hire them as an employee. Have them really learn product strategy with you because product strategy is really driven by the insights and the insights take months of constant data. You're, you're, you're immersing yourself with the data. You're immersing yourself with the qualitative insights. So the truth is it's hard to get external help. Um, if you really needed to, rather than a management consultant, which again focuses on business strategy, I would suggest getting some help from a product coach. So there are a set of people that provide product coaching, leadership coaching. I know Dan used to do that too, but I don't know if he still uh, does stuff like that. But where you go, you know, the lead, they go in and they really are, it's like an executive coach for the head of product. And, and I know people that do that if you want an introduction ever, so it's fine. But they are, uh, that's the other way to do it. Cool, thank you. I'm, I'm with you. It's um, so hard for these external people to get the context. And yes. um, yeah, um, if I can follow up um, similarly on the vision, on the product vision, would you say that is also something that has to be fully developed in house? versus getting some external help? You know, product vision, it works better to get external help, uh, although it's a different kind of external help. Uh, in fact, if you want introduction, I know some fabulous people that do this. They're really, yeah. what they are is awesome designers. <laughs> and because fundamentally it's about creating these conceptual prototypes that users are just gonna uh, love and uh, showing an experience and then making a, a video, for example, of that prototype. So hiring a, a really experienced designer that can partner with you on that is awesome. And uh, I love that. Now, of course, many of the companies I've worked at, I've had very experienced designers, so I just use my own people. But, if, but I have also advised companies where they didn't have that. They just had one or two junior designers. So I'm saying, no, let's, let's hire this design firm to help us make a great product vision. That's super helpful, especially around the designers. Well, just email me if you want an intro yeah, to one of definitely. us. No thank you. Sure. All right, Sylvia, thanks for your question. I appreciate it. Yeah, and Marty, thank, yeah, I still do. I think that, I think you can hire a coach, like you said. I also think that, um, you know, I, and I do select coaching for select leaders. It's actually fun when you get a really good product leader and you coach them, it's a lot of fun. But the other thing you can do, there's a, not a lot of people that do it, is go in and facilitate a process with the product leader and the exec team. And they're the ones that obviously know the business and the subject matter, but you're the one who knows the strategy frameworks and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so I think that, and, and then your point about designers, like getting a good vision prototype is key and, and not making sure you've got the appropriate design talent to do that, not trying to do it with junior talent is, is really important. So I think that's awesome. Um, okay, next up, we got Brian Cotto. Brian, if you're there. Hello, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Let me get, get you in here. Hey, Marty, uh, such a big fan. Uh, read Inspired twice. Uh, I'm personally a product manager that's a bit earlier in my career. So definitely has been helping me navigate uh, many conversations as being in the middle of many different stakeholder interactions. So, you know, my question for you is uh, around uh, product vision. And, you know, I think earlier in the talk, you made the comment of, you know, I think something along the lines of, you know, if you have 10 different visions, then, you know, that's not good. And I agree with that 100%. But I'm curious from the perspective of, you know, the larger companies that have complex businesses. So 
You know, I think Amazon is a good example where, you know, huge org, different business units, AWS, you know, retail. And I'm curious, you know, in a scenario like that, is it okay for, you know, the different business units to have different visions that cascade into our larger vision? Or should there still be a single vision and all of these um, sort of business units? Uh, how, I guess my question is, how do you navigate something like that? No, no, I get that question a lot. It's a good question. Um, so here's the thing. In very large companies, Amazon is a perfect example. So is Google. Uh, you, you might, you, you, usually have a common, one common mission. But even a mission like organize the world's information or be in the world store or whatever, that's really a reach for some of the things. It is normal at a company that size that the, the, each business unit would have their own vision. Um, so it's, it's almost, you know, Amazon's got a smaller number of very large ones, but imagine Google where there's YouTube and Google cloud and, uh, you know, search and ads, and those make a lot more sense. You, you wouldn't imagine that one product vision would help both YouTube and Google cloud. That would right. be, wouldn't make sense. So, uh, the, the general rule of thumb is the product vision should be as broadly applicable as possible up until the point where it doesn't make any sense. So if you get to the point where like, that's nonsense, we don't want that, then don't. But just to be clear, cause I, I just got this question just the other day from a, a company because I was talking to the director of product management for mobile. And what he wanted to do was create just a product vision and strategy just for mobile. And I said, you know, you can do that for sure. You can do that. But look what you're leaving on the table. Because in that model, mobile is just, you're going to optimize for mobile, but you're not going to optimize for the company. And so to me, mobile is an, a critically important part of a bigger strategy. So uh, I was encouraging him to not do it just for his org. Of course, he wanted to do it for his org because he's in control of that, right? He could say like, we can do our own thing. Who knows what the rest of the company, you know, is going to do. So I understood where he was coming from, but I thought he would be leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. Makes sense. Thanks so much. Appreciate the time. Sure. All right, great. Thanks for your question, Brian. And we'll do our last question. I know it's a little late here, folks. I, I mean, there's still 215 people hanging out, so I appreciate it, but it is getting a little late here. So uh, last question, we have Juliana Salgado. Juliana, if you could um, unmute and ask your question to Maury, that would be great. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm from Brazil, so it's pretty late here, and it's an honor to be watching with you. This yep. is the privilege of the quarantine, watching conference from mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. <laughs> so my question is about topology, because currently the topology of the teams have been changing a lot. Uh, sometimes the manager of the business unit might not even have a product background. So it might be someone from infrastructure that don't have uh, not e sometimes not even product sense. So how do you see that? So what's your vision about this kind of topology where everyone it's not really like the senior question it's more like how can someone that has not a product background have a pair help us with the to have like in power all right no it's a good question because it points out a common confusion team topology is not the same as org chart you are basically asking a question about what happens if in your organization chart, your leader of the whole business unit does not really understand product. That, by the way, you know, that's a separate issue. That's not team topology. Team topology doesn't talk about where people report. It talks about how product managers, designers, and engineers work together on specific teams, squads. 
So they all report to other people. That doesn't mean your question goes away. I'm just saying it's not a topology question. This is now, you're, you're really asking, can somebody that doesn't understand product be an effective business unit leader? Can they be an effective uh, head of the company? So, um, and I, I wanna be careful because um, I have a strong bias. To me, if you look at all the best product companies, the leaders are product people. Even In fact, the leaders are often engineers, right? They're engineers that have moved, you know, end up, but they came from engineering. They came from product management. A couple companies like Basecamp, like uh, Airbnb, they came from design, but they come from product in most of the great companies. So then the question is, uh, what if you don't have one of those people? What if you have somebody that came from finance or came from uh, business development or came from sales? So I, can, I do believe that they can still have a good organization, but they are going to have to really believe that this is important and they're going to have to hire leaders that work for them that are uh, strong. I, I think one of the best examples that we've seen visibly for the whole world has seen has been Microsoft. You know, Microsoft had originally a former engineer, Bill Gates, as their leader, who of course had a pretty great, you know, run. And then uh, he, he gave the company to his chief salesperson, Bomber, Steve Bomber, who I think is not, I mean, he's a very smart person, certainly an enthusiastic person, but I think he was a terrible leader for Microsoft and innovation pretty much stopped. And in fact, most of us, including me, thought Microsoft was done. It was just a slow, you know, they still had Windows and Office to pay them for a lot of years, but nothing was happening. And then the board of Microsoft realized that maybe they needed a product person again at the helm. And they brought in Sacha. They promoted Sacha, who has just turned that place around. Today, I am so impressed with Microsoft. So, um, so it's, I think it is really important. On the other hand, salesforce.com, which as you know, just acquired Slack. Um, salesforce, Benioff was a former salesperson, but he's a salesperson that I think totally got and gets product. So it's not impossible, but I think it's very hard. Amazing, amazing. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mary. You bet. Obrigado, Juliana. Well, thank you so much, Marty. I mean, get in here. We actually, you know what? Let me get in here because we usually take a picture at our meetup. So we're going to have to take a selfie this way. <laughs> not quite the same, but um, not quite the same. But you want to hold your book up? Can you hold up? I don't have a physical copy yet. It just came out. I'm waiting. Here we go. All right. Let's hold it up in the picture. Nice. All right. One, Oops. two, three. Oh, a little over. Cool. There you go. Awesome, man. Cool. So great. Very cool. Thank you, Marty, for an awesome talk. Thanks again for uh, arranging everything as usual. No, my pleasure, man. It was awesome. Thank you for making the time. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye.